So we're talking in the last video about the irrelation or absurd relation between the human being and God, which Kierkegaard argues that as we become more aware of this relationship, of the absurdity of this relationship, of the uncertainty of God, the passion of inwardness, the passion of faith, truth as subjectivity comes to the fore. The meaningful relationship of a subjective truth becomes to become alive. Okay? Um, and I want to continue on the same page, 207, <coughs> and then jump to, um, uh, let's see, 210 and 211. So 207, right after in the middle of the page, excuse me, this is again in the Kierkegaard Reader, the thesis that subjectivity, inwardness is truth, contains the Socratic wisdom that the undying merit of which is to have paid attention to the essential meaning of existing, of the knower's being an existing person. That is why, in his ignorance, Socrates was in the truth in the highest sense within paganism. To comprehend this, that the misfortune of speculative thought is simply that it forgets again and again that the knower is an existing person can already be rather difficult in our objective age. But to go beyond that, Socrates... Uh, but to go beyond Socrates and one has not even comprehended the Socratic, that at least is not so Socratic. Okay, what's he mean? Let's continue for a second uh, paragraph down, skipping. When subjectivity is inwardness, in truth, when subjectivity, inwardness, is truth, then truth, objectively defined, is a paradox. The truth, and that truth, is objectively a paradox, shows precisely that subjectivity is truth, since the objectivity does, does indeed thrust away, and the objectivity's repulsion or the expression of the objectivity's repulsion is the resilience and dynamiter uh, of inwardness. The paradox is the object of uncertainty that is the expression for the passion of inwardness that is truth. So much for the Socratic. Okay? What's he saying there? He's saying Socrates realized this. Socrates, the character who says in, in Plato's dialogues, I'm wise only because I know that I don't know. He says this in the Apology. He's wise because he knows he doesn't know, but he knows there's something to know. He knows he can't know it. But he doesn't give up the quest for knowledge. No, what does he do? He philosophizes. He becomes the philosopher. And for Kierkegaard, one of the highest religious stages you can get is to the Socratic, is to recognize the infinite gulf between you and God, um, to recognize the impossibility of reaching God. It's kind of, uh, Kierkegaard talks about this in The Concept of Irony as the kind of irony of the Mosaic Law that you can reach, uh, that St. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, for example. The good I want to do, I can't do. The bad I want to avoid, I can't avoid. Who will rescue me from this? In other words, I can't fulfill the law. There's an irony. Uh, so there's a, there's an analog here. Socrates realizes he, he desires to know, but he can't know. He only knows that he doesn't know, and he wants to know. So he goes through philosophical discourse, and it always ends in aporia or confusion. The analogy here is to the Judaic Mosaic law, uh, which commands, ironically, twofoldly, it commands, first and foremost, what no one can fulfill, right? No one can keep the commandments, right? Love, well, all the commandments are summarized in one commandment. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself, or love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or sometimes Jesus says, uh, uh, do to others what you would have them do unto you. This is the law and the prophets. In other words, the whole thing is summarized that way. Rabbi Hillel said that. But here's the problem. Who can love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? And who actually can love their neighbor as themselves? Who can actually treat everybody the way you'd like to be treated? I certainly can't. I certainly can't fulfill the Ten Commandments, right? Paul talks about this. So, um, and Kierkegaard says this. The, the, there's a, you almost have to come to a recognition in the Judaic sphere, which is analogous to the Socratic, that the law, that God's laws are commanded ironically. No one can fulfill them. God commands what no one can fulfill in order for you to aware, become aware of your own impotency, of your own powerlessness, of your own sinfulness. Moreover, Paul talks about in St. Paul, this is in Romans chapter 7, uh, not only does, is, does the law command what no one can fulfill, it actually incites me to do the opposite, right? I didn't know what it was not to covet until the law said don't covet. Then I go, well, what's that about, right? God says in the garden, you can eat of any of the trees, but not that tree. Why not that tree? In other words, the law just having the prohibition awakens sin, according to Paul, Okay. This is as far as one can get, or the highest stage one can get uh, in the religious life for Kierkegaard. We're going to see in a couple videos from now that uh, he talks about different stages in life, the aesthetic way, the eth ethical way, and then the religious way, the three stages. Don't worry about that for now. Uh, but then he goes on and says, all right, Socrates gets us farther, but there's something called what he calls paradoxical religiousness, or religiousness B. If Socrates is religiousness A, religiousness B is defined at the bottom of 2.10 and the beginning of 2.11. Subjectivity is truth. The paradox came into existence through the relation of the eternal, essential truth to the existing person. That's Socrates. I can't, the absurdity of that relation. Let us now go further on 2.11. Let us assume the eternal, essential truth is itself the paradox. 
How does the paradox emerge? By placing the eternal, essential truth together with existing. Consequently, if we place it together with truth itself, the truth becomes a paradox. The eternal truth has come into existence in time. That is the paradox. If the subject just mentioned was prevented by sin from taking, if the subject just mentioned was prevented by sin from taking himself back into eternity, he's talking about uh, uh, Socrates. Now he is not to concern himself with this because now the eternal essential truth is not behind him, uh, but has come in front of him by existing itself or having existed. So that if the individual existing does not lay hold of the truth in existence, he will never have it. On the bottom of the page, well, first of all, he says existence uh, cannot be accentuated more sharply than it has been here. Okay, the fraud of speculative thought in wanting to recollect itself out of existence in Plato has made it impossible. So he's going down. I recommend reading this page, but I just want to skip ahead a little bit uh, to the bottom. <clears throat> what then is the absurd? The absurd is the eternal truth has come into existence in time, that God has come into existence, has been born, has grown up, etc., has come into existence exactly as an individual human being, indistinguishable from any other human being, inasmuch as all immediate uh, recognizability is pre-Socratic paganism, and from the Jewish point of view is idolatry. What's he saying? He's saying, okay, the Socrates, the Socratic is as far as you can get, the irrelation of the eternal with the temporal, of the human being with God. But take that irrelation, that absurd relation, and make that into the truth itself. So, in other words, I'm trying to relate to God, the human being, and here's God, and they're irreconcilable. Take this irre irreconcilability and make that the object of faith. Then you get this, this I just poked myself in the eye, you get this uh, even more accentuated religiousness where God becomes a human being in, in Jesus. That's what he's talking about. That is the ultimate particular. It's the scandal of particularity. It's the offense, right? It's so offensive that a human being would claim to be God. That is the only proper object of faith for Kierkegaard because it's so absurd that a human being is God, okay? So well, all right now we have two, we have a paradoxical relation to the paradox or an absurd relationship to the absurd. Faith, therefore, is an absurd relation to an absurdity or the absurdity. Faith is a paradoxical relation to the paradox. Paradoxical relation to a paradox. That's what faith is. It's the paradoxical relation to the paradox. An absurd relation to an absurdity, the absurdity, the God-man. Uh, also, also, it's uh, an offensive relationship to the offense, the scandal.